Welcome to the Brain Gain Youngstown Leadership Series Podcast. Each week, we'll learn from leaders who are driving change and making an impact. Now here's your host, the CEO of the Youngstown Publishing Company, Jeff Leo Herman. I got the courage in me, let go and let it release. Don't stop from being the next, it's time for me to break the stone. Today we are joined by Mr. Ed Moransky. Ed is the chairman of the Moransky Companies, uh, which owns and operates the surgical hospital at Southwoods, the Lake Club, Auntie Anne's, just to name a few of their amazing brands. So listen as Ed shares his insights on entrepreneurship and some really interesting ways to transform our regional economy. The key takeaway of the discussion was that it all comes back to one word, and that word is love. So please listen and hear how Ed deploys love every single day to run this effective and impactful company. Ed Moransky, thanks for being here today. Thanks Appreciate for, your time. Yeah, haven't uh, haven't seen many people in the office, so it's great for you to be here. Now it's it's thrilled to sit down face to face with people and conduct these uh, interviews because what's important to know is, is we want to know as a child what did you want to be when you grew up? What did you aspire to oh, do? Oh boy. That's, a, that's an interesting one. I mean, uh, I know all the people around me because I was always very large. Everyone wanted me to be a football player. I didn't know if I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I, I think back like a lot of, uh, you know, kids that uh, were from the east side, south side, north side, that their parents worked in some type of mill. My dad worked in a uh, metal fabricating plant. I, I think you just wanted to do a little bit better than your mom and dad's generation. Mm -hmm. That maybe I didn't, you know, at that time wanted to work it and saw how dirty he came home and how hard he worked and he had two other jobs. And, you know, you appreciated the work ethic, but it was definitely uh, part my grandparents and them saying you have to go to school because that none of them, none of them were educated on the college level. So at that point, it was like, what are you going to be, doctor, lawyer, engineer? You weren't right. going to the mill. Um, they, they wanted you to, you know, do better. So I would say growing up, my mother's brother was a pharmacist in, Pen in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Ray Kokora. And uh, I went there one summer and uh, they had like a different life than I was used to on the south right. side of Youngstown. Right, right. You know, they had, uh, <clears throat> they had a, a house that was uh, pretty special and a business where, you know, if you wanted a cap gun, you got it and all that. And, uh, I always liked chemistry and that those math and stuff like that, so I was going to be a pharmacist. So it was kind of Uncle Ray was kind of from a leadership standpoint. I saw what he did. I saw how he treated my mother with getting her the medicines and things her and her and, and my dad and my grandma and grandpa needed. I, I loved his heart and I loved his passion toward uh, toward that uh, profession and. Uh, you know, really with that, you just, uh, you just see how people interact with relatives, with people he, you know, worked with and people who work for him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you're 10, 11, 12 years old, those are the kind of things you remember. So right. I don't remember specifically, but it was like you're going you're gonna to get your butt a little bit further than we were. And, uh, you know, no matter what, you were getting an, an education. You were getting right. that degree. Right. Uh, and, and you could see how today we see maybe too many people are going toward degrees maybe mm -hmm. maybe the uh you know what's going on in europe where you you know jim trestle and i have talked about it a little bit president trestle that you know we're having a a huge lack right now of uh you know people working in pipe fitting and air conditioning and, right and i think it's i think it goes back to kind of my generation and that what are you going to be doctor lawyer engineer and you were right. deemed a failure if you didn't go to college and you didn't make a go of that. Right. Um, whereas, you know, you take a look at it over in Europe, you know, you go in different directions. Some people go to college, some people go to technical school, some people go to work. Right, right. And uh, I thought it was an interesting statistic that about 80% of their leadership, uh, CEO, executive leadership, comes from the people that went to the technical school side and right. learned it technically and learned how to deal with people and weren't on the college educated side from a leadership point of view. Very interesting. That but, is uh, interesting. So practitioners play a big role in their economy. Yeah. Well, and that's, uh, I mean, findings, we, we've 
conducted 122 student interviews over the past several months, and we've actually found that there's still a stigma and still a bias for four-year degrees, and that the kids themselves said, we wish the trades and we wish the military would be more aggressive in pursuing us mm -hmm. and beyond just simply the, the recruiting and the visits, but actually show a path to what, what a successful career looks like. Yeah, and, and hopefully as generations move on, the stigma will become less and less. Right. But, uh, you know, we are working just in the Youngstown City Schools, I know. We're involved with Youngstown Community School and seven or eight other schools with the United Way and we have been really trying on career day. Career day used to be w what university are you going to? Right, right, right. right. And uh, you know career day now is going to Clayton Heating and Air Conditioning. Mm -hmm. and, you know what are the jobs in there and what, what kind of living do those people make and you know go going to see what the bricklayers are doing and going to see what a medical assistant does and what kind of job is that if you want to have a family. So it's, uh, you know, when you take a look, the one thing the kids are looking at today is that there's historically so much debt that's being taken by kids. Right. Uh, you know, if you go all the way to be a doctor, you might have three, four, five hundred thousand dollars of debt that you're mm -hmm. paying off over years and years and years before you start your life. So right. I think kids today are really taking a look at that and saying, what am I getting for my money? It's really not free money. Right. It's not right. a grant. It's not. I'm, I'm paying it back. And I think President Trussell down at YSU got it right as well in that don't just take a loan to take a loan to say you're going to college. If you're going to go to college, make sure you have a career path. Where is this headed? So at the end of the day, if you owe money, it was worth it for right. you. you. You have a skill set. You're a nurse. You're a... What, an engineer, what do you want to be from YSU? You're a business graduate, you're a CPA. And if you leave there with seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 of debt uh, and you're working when you're 23 years old, it, it makes sense. But I think, right. I think the kids of today are looking at that saying, wait a second, I could, I could go to this path, I could go to technical school for two years, come out and make $50,000 with the technical school or the union paying for my education and come out with no debt and work when I'm 25. And uh, some people who are in that for five, six years might make $100,000 a year. I think it's waking the kids up, right, kind right. of looking at that. And uh, you know, a lot of people that have gone the non four year educational route have been very, very successful, very happy in their life, uh, start out a lot quicker and with right. a lot less debt. Uh, it's just the stigma of the old country mm -hmm. ethnic mm -hmm. people coming over that they just push that their their definition of success was making sure that their next generation was better than the last. Right. And right. in my mindset, that was all about education. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot to do with it. Sure. Education is the base of all of that. But so many people have different skill sets. So right. education to you might be totally different than what a good education could have been to me. Right. So I went right. to Michigan Pharmacy School. Uh, not using much of that today. So I would, I would have got a heck of a lot out of those hundreds of thousands of dollars of scholarships if I would have taken business classes at Michigan. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could have been a little bit further along, you know, after my uh, playing days. But that's... Uh, that's something that I'm just seeing the younger younger generation, they're talking a little bit more about debt. Right, more deliberate and, choices. And, and taking a look at that, and I think we have to do a better job feeding the younger kids of seeing the world, of right. seeing the other jobs. So on that point, your Uncle Ray was a big influence. Do you think it's up to the families, or are there leaders out there? What, what level of leadership is required? Is, can the families get it done? Is it the school, the administration? Is it national leadership? Like, where do you think we fall? I think the answer is yes. All <laughs> I think of the it's above, all. Right? I think it's all of those. If you if you take a look at it, the uh, the family unit today, let's just say, is not as good maybe as it was 50 years ago. Right. Um, some of that by just the fact that you have both people in a marriage working. Mm -hmm. There's less family time around the table for dinner. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, just a different outlook on goals and things of, of families and a lot of single parent, you know, homes that are going. So I think to put it totally on the parents or the people that are responsible for the kids can't get it totally done. Mm -hmm. Everybody is going to school. So I think a lot of this has to be kind of a public-private situation right. to kind of get this done. 
to make sure that the kids, while they're at school, uh, have their eyes open and uh, see the world a little bit differently. Sister Jerome, who started Youngstown Community School, told me a long time ago that you, you don't understand. K kids in, the, in some of these situations don't, aren't even in the same world of life that you live. They don't know where they're sleeping. Right. They don't have a phone. They don't have cable TV. They don't have the educational tools and even sometimes the love that other families do. Mm -hmm. And you have to treat them that way to make sure that when they come into the school that they're responsible and that you are responsible for opening and broadening their horizons. Right. You, you had, a, am sure, a great background to you with your parents or grandparents to show you the world. I was lucky enough to have that as well. The kids that don't have that, I think we really owe it, and I think it's the key to society in, in opening up that world so that they see that there's more to what they could be or do than they're, they're just you know, a, not a success because they didn't go to college, or they're not a success because they got kicked out of high school and they don't know how to get back into it. So I think it's a little bit of parenting and grandparenting or somebody at home that loves them not what it was so we've got to supplement that with the educational side and I think even our educators can't do it themselves so here comes the private side to uh, in my opinion to be in there and kind of show the kids the world. Are educators open to that more private involvement? Oh yeah, yeah. much much more than in. historically I mean historically you would have you know curriculum being set and this is what we do and we take one field trip a year mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody's getting it. I think the discussion at, at all levels, whether it's Youngstown State or Eastern Gateway, Youngstown City Schools, some of the community schools, I think everybody's getting it that we have to broaden the horizons of the kids. We have to educate them so that kids graduating, even from high school, have a direction. And, and if we could do that, we could keep them off unemployment. We could keep them off having assistance and feeling good about themselves going in a direction. Is there a leader that you would encourage them to look up to? So say you're talking to a group of kids, who would you encourage them to model or to emulate? You know, I think, I think in everybody's life you have different leaders and different people that, that pass you by that make an impression. So mm -hmm. I always tell kids, make sure you have your eyes open. <clears throat> There's going to be two or three people in your life, whether you want to call them leaders or mentors or whatever that are going to change your life. Be open to it. Understand that you don't have the world totally figured out. Right. Understand, right. you know, that you think you're going to be a pharmacist and that's probably not going to happen. And, and embrace it and know that that's okay. Right. Um, I think, you know, from that standpoint, uh, you know, a, a leader is a leader. And that when we had talked about Coach Tressel going to Akron, you know, Mr. Tressel to President Tressel, I think a lot of people looked at that and said, hmm, you know, he's not from academic land. You know, you know that's, that's really not a great technical choice. But you take a look at that, when we, when we talked to him about it, my feeling was that he's a leader. Mm -hmm. You know, the head football coach is a CEO. Right. You know, right. they have 100 people underneath them doing things, and it, it all has to come together on Saturday afternoon and at the end of the day, they raise money, they take right. care of personnel, very, very similar. Similar. So <clears throat> to me, he from somebody who embraces um, education, not just at the YSU level, but knows that YSU is doing better today because the kids that shouldn't be at YSU and being educated someplace else are someplace else. Right. And that right. they're not wasting time and energy that they should be in a different direction, whether that's couple years at a junior college before they're ready for YSU, whether it's a technical school, uh, President Tressel embraces that. So as you look at education and, and the direction, I know how he talks to the kids. Uh, educationally, I think the greatest leader we have in our community is President Tressel in that he embraces it. I see how he is with kids. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're having a, a question in your life and he'll take time to do it, go, go have a conversation with him because he's not just... You've got to go to YSU. Right. Well, he's got to do You've got to do this. I mean, he gets it. He, <laughs> right. he, he gets what it takes. Right. He's very close to the governor and trying to make things change. But 
in the whole political process of, of education, sadly. Yeah, enrollment it's, pressures it's, yeah, lead you, to short-term you know, you're, decisions. You're fighting one to another, so w what is it? In his view, if he made YSU better, you would attract a better student. Right. You would have more kids graduating, which would allow you more money the way the state divvies up you know, higher education uh, money, uh, and it's working. The Brain Gain is a collaborative effort, and we'd like to thank the headlining members of the coalition, including Sweeney Chevrolet Buick GMC, the Moransky Companies, and the Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition. Also included are Farmers Bank Group, Youngstown State University, Eastern Gateway Community College, the DeBartolo Corporation, Cortland Bank, MS Consultants, and 898 Marketing. So we're going to transition a bit and focus more on your day-to-day -day leadership style. How do you, so Coach Tressel, discipline, inspiration, motivation throughout his, well, I should, I'm sorry, President Tressel, right? We have to right. refer to him, but it, it goes, you know, all those directions. Like, yeah, what's so, your leadership style? So, so the, the interesting thing is from a coaching tree, mentor tree, leadership tree, President Tressel comes from the Woody Hayes tree. Right. From his dad at Baldwin Wallace. President Tressel's dad was a head coach of Baldwin Wallace for all those years, and then him at Ohio State uh, and, and Woody and coming back to Youngstown State, et cetera. I come from the Bo Beckler tree. A lot of people think it's crazy that they're the same, but they are. Mm -hmm. Post Postmortem, they loved each other. They were rivals. They started the whole Michigan-Ohio State rivalry. Right. Uh, but their, their leadership styles were very similar in that uh, President Tressel and I believe wholeheartedly, and especially like in his, if you take a look at the great YSU teams that won national championships, or the Ohio's, great Ohio State teams. When he came home, I, I, my, my hair stood up and we were talking about this. And he said, uh, you know, what's your philosophy in business? And I said, uh, they hate me, but it's like Bo, you, you know, every day you either get better or you get worse. There's no staying the same. Right. Because if you're staying the same, even from a business journal standpoint, there's somebody today trying to go after your marketing dollars right now. Correct. So if you're not thinking about the next year, the next five years, and thinking that you're doing great and you could pedal in place, uh, you know, that's my philosophy, Coach. And he said, uh, you've got to read a book because that's my philosophy as well. And the book is called, If It Ain't Broke, Break It. <laughs> and the whole, the whole thought process is that whether it's a team that's just won the national championship or an administration at a university or one of my companies, that leadership has to always, from my, the way I look at it, that we are constantly challenging ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I take the hospital. We are at the top in every category imaginable from a customer service quality standpoint at that hospital. Yet, if you would sit in my Wednesday meetings with my management staff and how I challenge them for our thousand employees, you would think that we were at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I take care of them, I love them, I, I, but I, you know, I look at what they're doing as what they should be doing. So where are we taking it to the next level? Right. So, so the Southwoods way, what's the next level of the Southwoods way? What could we be doing different as women get mammograms? What are we doing different with the evolution of people staying in the hospital less? How are we making that stay better? How are we taking care of pain patients and spine patients and not having to have them drive to, you know, outside of Youngstown to have stuff done? Right. So it was very eerie when he came back that he and I had that discussion as he became that, that it's, it, it's kind of looking different, but my, my whole way from Bo is that you never stay the same. Right. Every day you get better or worse. President Tressel's the same way. That's my philosophy. And I think from my point of view, I look to my leaders then, the, the people that run my divisions and the people that work for them, is that I'm a manager by objective. I, there are no time clocks for my managers. Uh, they know exactly what they should be doing and how they do it and are talked to if they're not. Uh, but I, I believe in allowing to have your managers manage. Right. So from their standpoint, there's a balance to that and how they get things done. But I, I look at the, at the end product. Um, and then lastly, and I think the 
common denominator of all the companies is that learn this from another mentor, Don Papino, that you and I have talked about in the past, mm -hmm. is that uh, you always treat people the way you would want to be treated. And a lot of people say that, but you know, my, my big thing for all people that work you know, underneath me is not that they just make great money and have a, a great lifestyle in Youngstown, Ohio, or Boardman, Ohio, or wherever they live, but that they enjoy driving to work. Right. And I think a lot of people who are in business forget about that, and that, that's my job. There are a lot of things that people do that are very difficult in all of my companies, very hard. You're dealing with life and death situations. You're dealing with having to make 5,000 pretzels in a day. I mean, crazy hard stuff. And at the end of the day, I just want to make sure that they know that they are uh, well respected and taken care of. Right. Sometimes it's just picking up the phone and saying thank you. Right. Sometimes it's during a tough time when you have a death that there's some flowers that show up. Mm -hmm. Those are the little things, in my opinion, that make people better workers because they love driving to work. Right. So right. leadership-wise, I think you, you have to be multifaceted in that, A, you have to be out there five to ten years. I mean, there's things in my head and stuff we're working on right now where I think things are going in all of our industries that you just have to be ahead of. But you have to live in the present to make sure I'm as good as the lowest person on my totem pole because that, that's who might run into you. So right. you, you might be in the hospital and that person who is, you know, not deemed to be a doctor or a lawyer is your contact right. with Southwoods. Right. And if, if they don't treat you right or they're having a bad day, that's your impression of Southwoods. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, is there a set of core values that guides everyone top to bottom? Uh, yeah, I would say the, the two things are uh, do the right thing when no one's looking. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, e it's easy to be Father O'Neill, another mentor, a wonderful priest from our area, uh, started talking to me when I was 16, 17 years old about be an unselfish giver. Mm -hmm. and it's like, what does that mean? Like, be an unselfish giver. And, um, and the whole issue with, with being an unselfish giver is don't expect anything in return, which then leads into do the right thing when no one's looking. Right. So just, just because you don't get the pat on the back, just, be, just because you don't get the headline, do it anyway. Right. And, uh, you know... I, I try to instill that and give all of our people the, the chance to do that, but do the right thing when no one's looking and it will come back to you in droves um, on how it makes you feel. And right. so, so many people are so afraid to give something, either of themselves or money, and they hold it to themselves and, and to embrace, embrace happiness, you almost, right. you almost have to open those hands and feel it. And once you do, um, you know, it's, it's probably one of the great lessons of my life that unselfish giving is truly the, the key to, in, in my way, a lot of ways, uh, happiness in my life. Right. And, and are, are those people maybe afraid of making mistakes? Like a lot of people learn through mistakes and even from a leadership standpoint, I'm sure you've made leadership mistakes over time. What leadership mistakes have you made and how have you used those as opportunities to? Well, I, I think, I think, on, on your first question, I think people, um, most people are followers. Right. So, so you, you have leaders in, in every step of your life. You could think back in high school, grade school, who are the leaders? They change in your profession, on your street. Mm -hmm. If you live in a condo, there's normally two voices and 78 people that march one way or another. Right, right. right. And... Uh, a lot of times people like that just, just aren't used to, to doing up. that. Yeah. They're just not brought up that way. So, um, you know, I, the second part of that is from a leadership standpoint, and I just had a conversation about a, another, another opportunity that came our way in a whole new industry locally. And uh, Care to share it here? <laughs> yeah, it's a newspaper. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no. Um, and because of something happened in the past leadership-wise is that I, I said no to an opportunity or had at least no more or partner with somebody in that uh, a mistake I made early in my career was with my father-in-law and sister-in-law and our family. 
uh, we invested in a company called Shoney's Family Restaurants. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had just started franchising and it was a, uh, it was a diversification of what we did. And we got into partnership with somebody who was who, who knew how to run the restaurant business, and uh, oh boy, was that a mistake! And uh, the person who we thought was running the restaurant business really didn't know what he was doing, and we were pretty deep into it already. And uh, from a leadership standpoint, it was it was like I'm a businessman because I have money, so I can invest and let's go do things and. Kind of what it taught me from my point of view is that not that I have not that I'm a control freak, but I can fix things. Right. So if I'm in control and I'm doing them, even crazy restaurants, we could we could somehow figure them out or you close them. But in the in the Shoney's case, we were we were deep into it with somebody other than ourselves that had the knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and what it taught me was two things. One was at an early age, kind of how to think through. Uh, the evolution of getting into stuff that you don't totally understand. The businesses are the same. You still have customers, you still have to treat your employees well, you have third party people that supply you. All businesses are relatively the same, but the restaurant business versus the insurance business, the moon and the stars different. Right, right. The restaurant business to the healthcare business, moon and the stars is what knowledge you have to have. So. With working with my father-in-law, it taught me leadership-wise on the, the, the couple other things that you had to ask mm -hmm. prior to just investing your money. Right, right. And the second thing it taught me is how to work out of a bad situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a good situation, it's easy to invest your money and, and spend your money and go on trips and buy things. And right. that's the fun part. Right. But when you have an entity that's not making money and you still have millions of dollars to pay back to the banks, uh, you got to figure that one out. So luckily we had owned the real estate, we reinvented those locations, we sold them and uh, you know, at the end of the day it was one of the great educations, I always call it my master's degree in business, right. in that it, it, it really, really taught me uh, as we get into new things even at the hospital, that you've got to look at these things two, three different ways. And are you getting in, in business with the right people? If it's not with the right people, how do you gain this knowledge? You know, when we got into imaging, you know, it made sense. People wanted us to be in imaging. We right. did a lot of cancer care. We needed PET scans. We needed this and that. I didn't know much about imaging. So we, we, we strategically looked and looked and looked at about three partners. And because of my history with Shoney's, I knew the two partners were not the way to go. Right. Right. The one was. Right. The one had three solid radiologists that want a Hitchcock X-ray, okay. Genesis Breast Center. Right. Uh, we ended up uh, acquiring them, and it was a perfect match because they did things the Southwoods way. They were quality. Um, you know, the the price was fair for the assets and things we were getting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if I didn't go through the leadership th mistake, I would have never had the thought process to make as many good decisions as we've been making lately. Right, right. So that's an important, basically important advice for students and youth is don't be afraid to get out there and if you make a mistake, things, you can recover, right? Yeah. Everything's recoverable. But have integrity. Right. You know, make, make sure your word is your word. But, um, you know, you, you take a look at any person that anybody listening to this looks up to from a financial or business standpoint and you go on their site, you're going to find the Shoney's. Mm -hmm. you're, you're going to find things that they got into that they ultimately got out of and it right. made them better people. Right. You know, right. You, know you look at, at the, you know, one of the most successful companies at Apple. I mean, go, go take a look at that in a garage. Right. They could not get space. Right. They couldn't get anybody to listen to them. Who, who, who would talk about a small little mini computer when they were as big as this room at one time? Right. Right. And uh, you know, so I, I think with that you've got to you've got to take adversity and make it into something. So so many people get down on themselves when things don't go right. Sometimes, whether it's even a career change that might have to happen, sometimes during those most adverse times become some of your greatest opportunities. Right. Well, one would say that even our regions had adversity over the decades. 
So what would you recommend, where is the future of our region? What would you recommend from a leadership standpoint? How can our region take a leadership role uh, at, the, at the state level, at the national level, or even just locally? Like, what do we need to do to really continue evolving and transforming? Well, um, our region is not what it was 50 years ago, size-wise or anything else. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand the resources we have is that we are probably sitting in the greatest location from a transportation hub in the United States of America. Right. Uh, the only way we can attack that is as a region. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the, the great things that could be done, if you, if you take a look at, nobody wants their cheese moved. So, right. you know, um, all the mayors out there, all the police chiefs, all the fire chiefs, uh, this is not against you, just pro-region is that we really have to take a look at Mahoning County and Trumbull County and Columbiana as a region. Mm -hmm. we, we all win, even right. Western Pennsylvania. Right. If, if we could draw industry here, and that industry creates jobs, and those jobs creates a Whole Foods or a Cheesecake Factory if they're still, you know, that makes our whole lifestyle better. Every, right. everybody, is, uh, everybody is using that. So, um, you know, to me, I think we can do a better job bringing the, the regions together. So if I, if I could be God for a day, there would be one school system. There would be one police and fire for Mahoney County. I mean, you're still going to have regional, uh, you know, hubs, you know, so the, the Boardman Fire Station is not going to uh, have to put out a fire from Austin Town. But I just look at I just look at how we fight for things that Austin Town is fighting for Boardman or you know this this new entity is fighting against another municipality to get the same thing that's good for our whole region that I would right. I would love to see one police one fire from a management standpoint right school systems from a management standpoint not that you don't have local representation not that Poland still isn't going to have a school board in what direction but when you take a look at how much money is being spent on every, every, just look at the school systems. Every school system, no matter how large or small Mahoney, Trumbull, Columbia, and County, has, you know, principles, has, you know, leadership that, you know, it's who is a, the superintendents. They have maintenance coordinators, you know. Special cor curriculum. So special, yeah, right? Right. And... That duplication is millions of dollars that could go back into the education of our kids mm -hmm. as opposed to the administration. And not going to change overnight, but I think if you, if, you, if you take a look at that evolving, if you take a look at us becoming more of a region where we could really go and look at Lordstown and say, hey, we, we have 10 times the TJ Maxx's and the battery plants. It's all there. Right. But, you know, what are they looking at when they come in? They look, they look for a cohesive place. They look for a place that they could go acquire people to work for them, whether it's an engineering job from a university. You know, they want to attract people to come to our region. So the better the region is, the better the bike trail is. Right. The better the downtown Youngstown is or downtown Warren, the better the downtown Columbiana, the greatest place in America to live. The more things like that, the easier it is for LG to come in here and, you know, say, hey, you're an engineer. Come to Lordstown, Ohio. There's, you know, a lot of places to live around there. It's a great lifestyle. Right. right. And I think if we could approach it <laughs> and have better education, <clears throat> a condensed management group that puts more money in the kids, and it's going to take time, 10 or right. 15 years, <clears throat> and create something that for our kids and their kids' kids, that there's an attraction to coming back here. Mm -hmm. It's already a great lifestyle. We right. already know we have great people out there. We have great educators. We have a lot of things going for us. But with the mills going away and, you know, it's Midwest 101 kind of trying to reinvent the Rust Belt, um, we have to take advantage of our regional approach of transportation, are, you know, the loading dock to the Midwest. Yeah. And from right. our standpoint, you have, um, you know, 50 great schools within driving distance of here. So that no matter what you are, you could go recruit some of the great, great K 
kids that are graduating from Youngstown State or Baldwin Wallace or Pitt or even the Ohio State University, whatever, um, that could fill those needs. So that, that to me would be my wish. I've seen it in other areas of the country where it's working, um, where, where you have that kind of massive regional approach. And boy, when they have a chance to attract something, they just go get go it. Go after it, right. Yeah. So is there a greater than a 50% probability that this could actually happen at some point? Like, what would it take? Is this back on public-private partnership and really collaborating to drive this type of concept forward? Yeah. I think it would take President Tressel, when he retires, right. to come and be the regional president of our area <laughs> right. and kind of push that over 10 or 15 years. Hey, listen, change is tough. Right. If, if, I'm, if I'm sitting there as superintendent of Poland Schools and I'm, you know, uh, you know, I, I love, uh, you know, what goes on there. Uh, obviously, that's your work. Mm -hmm. So do you really want Poland to merge with Lowville or Struthers or Camel? But if you, if you look at it constructively, if I'm a, if I'm a Red Devil, I, I grew up with my grandparents in, in Camel. So I love Camel. All right. Struthers, wonderful community that is, you know, still a wonderful place to live and, and, uh, and always has been. Uh, you know, you take Lowville, Canfield, and Struthers. They have a wonderful place in downtown Struthers called the Caslo Works down there. Right. Right. Yet, because this is all we know, and we're gonna we're gonna protect the Red Devils, or we're gonna protect Cardinal Mooney, and we're gonna protect that. You had three schools built within a two mile, three mile radius when the populations of those places are now a third of what they used to be. Right. When they had their own. Right. But I've got to be a Lowville Rocket. I've got to be a Cardinal Mooney Cardinal. So that old mindset has to go away, and the leadership has to embrace the change of region. You know, so what are the chances of that? It's not the mindset today. But I think if you look at it, I think a Caslo kind of organization having all three schools under one school building. Right. Imagine, you know, from my standpoint, the education, the athletics, and the, the vibrancy of right. that kind of thing. But nobody wants to give up their Cardinal Mooney. Nobody right. wants to give up their Ursula. Nobody wants to give up. So there has to be a give and take. What I'm talking about is the, it's a political issue standing in the way of, mm -hmm. and, and a very real financial issue. And right. you ha you know, you're going to have people that their jobs get consolidated and get into something else. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the regional mentality is something that has to happen. Um, <laughs> I, I think I've had discussions with our local commissioners, Mahoney County and Trumbull County. I think they get it. Um, it's just very difficult to bring everybody together because right. historically, you look at Trumbull County and Mahoney County, it's like, boy, you should be doing things together. I mean, it's like the demilitarized zone. There's not, right. <laughs> you know, stuff, stuff just doesn't flow between those two counties. So how that wall comes down, how, how people start working together. But uh, I think if we're gonna be successful, it, it can't just be Lordstown out there trying to get something done with right. the you know, Mahoney County economic development people. It's, it's gotta be our region. We've gotta have the oomph, you know, from Western Pennsylvania, you know, all the way to Akron, who's trying to get what? Because the more, the more we would get in those three counties, the more we could then do developmental wise yeah. with housing and like the river there's 750,000 people from Ashtabula down towards West Virginia yeah that's a mega region yeah right? it's an uber region that mm -hmm. as you said has transportation advantages yep natural resource advantages yeah. from the Ohio access advantages. to the Ohio River access to all the I-80s and turnpikes and the mm -hmm. The statistics are, I think you can get the 60% of the United States population from Youngstown in a day's drive. Right, I mean, that's right, right. Well, this sounds uh, like a good place to wrap up. So do you have any favorite leadership quotes? You look at something on the wall, something you refer to on a consistent basis, a quote you'd like to share? Yeah, um, I do. It's a, it's a Mother Teresa. It's not one quote. It's a, it's a whole uh, dialogue of probably 10 or 12 things. But... You know, basically the gist of it is that what you build up during your lifetime, somebody can take it down in a day. Mm -hmm. um, even even if you're doing things for the right reason, people might think otherwise. Uh, 
if you are successful, people might be jealous. And all the way down the list, it's kind of do it anyway. Mother Teresa says, if this, if that, do it anyway. Um, because the last line of it, because it never was between you and them anyway, it's between you and God. Right, right. So I think with that, as you, as you roll and you stick, stick your neck out to be a leader, I think you have to uh, be willing to take the consequences of that and to have a little bit of a leather neck to be able to kind of take that on and as long as you, what I talked earlier, as long as you do things for the right reason, as long as you do things right when nobody's looking, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you could have that leather neck that people are going to perceive you differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sooner you understand that as a human being out there, that all of us are so different inside that not everybody, no matter what you think, is going to perceive you the way you want to be perceived the way you perceive yourself. Right. You might be 100% right, but emotionally I'm totally different, my mindset's different, my heart's different. You know, you and I have no trouble seeing a poor person that is born with a defect on their hand uh, and we accept that. Yet we think everybody inside is emotionally the same and right. they're not. Right. Some people are born with one arm inside. Right. And the sooner you accept that in life, uh, I think the easier it is to take people that are not going to see things your way, but, you know, uh, it's, it's part of being a leader that you have to do that. But you also have to be a listener and you have to be willing to learn. And if you would talk to any great leader, um, they're very collaborative and today is a different day that they're going to learn something. Right. So they're never done learning either. Right. And you have to embrace that. Excellent. Excellent. Ed, thanks so much for your time today. You're very Learned welcome. A lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for supporting The Brain Gain. Before we go, I'd like to thank members of the Brain Gain Coalition, especially our great sponsors. Without them, none of this would be possible. So a big thank you goes to Sweeney, Chevrolet, Buick, GMC, the Moransky Companies, and the Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition. Thanks so much for their support. And also, please follow, like, and subscribe to this series on your favorite podcast player. And if you have any questions, just go ahead and connect with me on LinkedIn, one of my favorite places. You can find me over there at Jeff Leo Herman and send me a message. I will see you next time. I'm growing up in this life and to the human that I need to be. I know that I am not alone.